right, we're up on YouTube. All righty. So I think, um, Boz, I, I don't know if um, Viraj told you, I'll, I'll monitor the chats on LinkedIn and YouTube. Sometimes we get a few questions and I'll just send them through Slack. You, you don't have to answer them right away. Sometimes people ask questions that are off topic or can derail the conversation. So yeah, I'll just send them in Slack so you have them for you to answer whenever you want or, or not if sure. it's not relevant. Yeah, I think uh, the first half hour I just uh, speak and then uh, we can answer the questions. Yep. Okay. Good there. Recording. All right. Well, I'm going to turn off my video and microphone. And, um, and then I'll launch up the actual webinar so people can start joining Zoom. All righty. Got 10 people in here. Um, fast, we usually like to wait until just about five minutes past. Uh, just yep. let everyone file in. Um, and then in those five minutes, we awkwardly do some sort of icebreaker. <laughs> so, do, you have a, do you have a favorite icebreaker that you like? <laughs> Oof. Uh, this is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I blindsided you there a little bit. <laughs> um, Um, how about we just do the easy one? Like, where are people dialing in from? So you want to just put your location in the chat. Um, that's that's the that's that's always the lowest hanging fruit. Um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Hey, coffee, you're in France. Wow, Berlin, Portugal, Austin, Northern Virginia. Oh wow, everywhere. <laughs> oh, awesome. Any Dutch here? Uh, where are you in the Netherlands, boss? I'm in a uh, Hague. How do you pronounce that? Sorry, one more time. The Hague or De Hague. Haag. Oh, very cool. In Dutch, yeah. Oh, we're already at over 100 folks in here. Let's give it about three more minutes. Where else do we have folks? South Jersey, Melbourne. Not know See, Melbourne, Melbourne, Florida. Yeah, I was going to say, didn't know there was a Melbourne, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I read about, uh, I read this article a uh, long time ago. And there's a uh, Sydney in uh, somewhere in the US, I think. There was this person that flew to the wrong Sydney. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, PR, yes, the live session will be on YouTube afterwards. Uh, we have Tel Aviv, Brazil, Israel. Wow, that's cool. You get to see the launches from your driveway. All righty, let's give it two more minutes. I'll be sure we're starting in two minutes at uh, five past the hour. A lot of turnout for this one, so I guess it must be a popular topic. 
see here. Always exciting. Right? Always um, exciting, Desi. <laughs> <laughs> see a lot of familiar faces here too. Oh, sorry, familiar names. I can't see anyone's faces. Always good to see the recurring folks here. Budapest, wow. Airflow all over the world. Bass, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome, I can kick things off and then I'll hand the mic over to you. Um, first off, thanks everyone for coming to hang with us on this Tuesday. Um, this is our deep dive webinar. So every other week we do a deep dive into a particular airflow topic, uh, just to kind of, uh, you know, help kind of the community start talking about best practices around, around something. Um, just a couple of logistic notes. Uh, please drop your questions in the chat or the Q&A as we go along here, and we'll get to them right after the content. Um, all of the content, the recording, and as well as the code samples will be available after. You know, we'll send out a follow-up email for that. Um, and as always, you know, if you have a suggestion for a topic you'd like to see, or you know you want to talk more deeply about something you're doing in Airflow, feel free to shoot us a note and we'll happily get back to you. Um, with that said, I uh, would love to introduce uh, the guy who wrote the book on Airflow, quite literally, <laughs> Bass from the astronomer team, uh, to start talking about uh, Airflow testing. So Bass, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the next, uh, just under an hour, I'll talk a little bit about testing and I'll start sharing my screen first. I'll keep this open because I'm uh, gonna switch between screens. Okay. So testing airflow to bulletproof your code. Um, don't take it literally, but uh, we hope to, uh, after this uh, presentation and a uh, couple of questions uh, that uh, you feel a bit more uh, certain that your code works in production before you deploy it there. Uh, so there's a little agenda for tonight. Uh, so a little bit about general testing in Python, and then I'll dive into the Airflow uh, testing with a couple of uh, topics from uh, ranging from simple, uh, so unit testing uh, individual operators down to uh, yeah, complete environments, so a bit more complex. <clears throat> so first, before we start testing with Airflow itself, uh, Couple of slides on testing in Python. Uh, there's different ways to do this, uh, but uh, Python has a built in framework called unit test. So you just import unit test and uh, you're good to go with a couple of uh, uh, yeah, ways to test your code. There's many other frameworks as well besides unit test, but those are all third party. Uh, PyTest is uh, highlighted in bold over here uh, because it's a very, pro very popular third party framework to use. Um, it's also used by Airflow open source. And uh, in the next couple of slides and uh, examples that I'll show, I'll also use PyTest. So uh, you just uh, pivot install PyTest and then you're good to go with that. And on the right side here, I have a directory tree. Uh, this is the typical project structure for testing. So you generally have a folder with DAGs, maybe you have some custom code and tests follow the same structure there. So you have a DAGs directory there, maybe a package directory and uh, generally uh, a good project structure uh, mimics the structure of your actual uh, project. Um, so what does a test look like? Basically a test, a uh, unit test uh, validates a certain piece of uh, logic. So let's say you implemented a multiply method. It takes two variables A and B and you multiply them and you want to be sure that uh, your multiply method indeed, indeed multiplies correctly. So we give it numbers two and three, and we check using the assert keyword if the result is indeed six. So this is a very simple test. Uh, one thing to note here with uh, PyTest, you have to uh, prefix your test with test underscore, and then uh, PyTest will be able to auto discover those. So after this, we'll dive a bit more into uh, how to do this with Airflow specifically. Uh, one reason why I like PyTest so much over unit test is uh, well, for a couple of reasons, but one of them is uh, that they support this, these things called fixtures. 
I think they uh, they give you a bit more flexibility than uh, the setup and teardown methods in uh, in unit test uh, because they are basically like reusable Lego blocks that you can uh, use in your test. So you define a, a, a method, you annotate it with PyTest fixture, and then whenever you uh, use it as an argument in your test, then PyTest knows, hey, uh, this person or this test uh, will take the argument A or the fixture A here uh, and use that. Uh, you can use that fixture throughout your tests. So this example is very, very simple, but uh, as your as your test and your project grows bigger, these uh, PyTest uh, Py fixtures, they can be reused throughout tests and that gives you a lot of flexibility. So whenever I start a uh, an Airflow project, I uh, generally, start with this test, the, the DAG integrity test. And I see this go by many names, uh, DAG validity test or check or integrity test. Um, name it whatever you like, but it's uh, it looks like this. And it's basically a, a simple sanity check on your DAGs. Uh, and it will filter out a couple of basic things like uh, required arguments. So if you say uh, you forgot the, the DAG ID on your on your DAG, then this will, this will fill. Uh, so, the test will instantiate this thing called a DAG bag. And a DAG bag is, a, it's, it's kind of like an internal airflow class. You as a DAG developer never really use this, uh, but the scheduler in, in airflow internally uses this to, to parse DAG files. Um, and we can use that in our test to, to basically use the same logic. Uh, so whenever you call a DAG bag, it loads all the DAGs in your DAG directory. And it doesn't really fail straight away if there's an error in your DAG. Uh, and, uh, and the reason for that is it first scans over all files uh, and it, um, yeah, uh, it collects the errors basically instead of failing on the very first error. So we have to assert after instantiating DAG back if there are no import errors. And this, uh, like I said, will is it's kind of like a sanity check and will filter out a lot of errors. So let me show you what that looks like. So I have my DAG integrity check here with the code that I just showed. Um, and if I have any uh, any simple uh, yeah error in my uh, in my DAG, so here I have a hello world DAG, and let's say I make a cycle which is not a, a valid DAG, it should be acyclic. So this is not allowed in Airflow, and I run my test, then it should fail saying something like, you're not allowed to have a cycle. Hey, Bas, um, yeah. Can you increase the font size just a little bit? Uh, so oh, my bad. Yep, no worries. Come on. Come on, plus. Let me just, uh, does this work? Uh, this, uh, this is not really working. Uh, thought it was command plus. It might be in view appearance. Maybe the presentation mode works out. Oh, there we yeah. go. Don't see where the you don't see the full uh, window, but hopefully <laughs> it is readable. Um, so basically, you have a a DAG bag, and then you ensure if there's no import errors. Then I have to exit this again. Ah. Uh, oh, in the run. And at the bottom, if you scroll down uh, at the bottom of your log file, there's, uh, if there's an error in your test, you'll always see some, something useful uh, where there's an E and here it says assertion error cycle detected in DAG. And the, yeah, that's because the DAG bag loaded and it detected the cycle there, which is one of the checks that a DAG bag performs.
but just to give another example, let's say um, you, for whatever reason, forgot your DAG ID. So now we have a, yeah, a nameless DAG. Again, this is not allowed by, uh, yeah, this is a required argument. So this should fail. And again, our test failed. You scroll down to the bottom and then you have to sc scroll a little bit through the, the log files, but there's a hint here, which says missing one required argument, daggity. So this test filters out a lot of yeah, silly programming mistakes, which you might make. And uh, yeah, for myself, when I'm programming, this filters out like 80% of my mistakes. So it's super useful uh, to start your project with it. On top of that, uh, if you like to perform additional checks in your uh, in your DAX, you can, uh, yeah, at uh, some sort of conventions. Uh, so for example, if you want all your DAX to include uh, to have a tag, you can perform additional checks on all the DAX in your DAG bag. And the way to do that is uh, on your DAG bag, there's an attribute called DAGs. And you can basically for every DAG uh, check certain things like, does it have a tag? So again, if we go back to our code, say this thing has no tags and we run our dagger integrity test. Wait a couple of seconds. And then says, hello world in this file has no tags. So that's how you can uh, apply or enforce certain conventions in your project. <clears throat> so this uh, this for me filters out like 80% of my, uh, my CD program mistakes. Uh, so it's uh, probably one of the most valuable tests I have in my project. Uh, so, with that, let's go into specific uh, operators or hook uh, testing with uh, the help of unit testing. Um, so the, the, the most simplest way to test an operator in Airflow is basically by calling execute on it. And if this is, uh, yeah, gives you a workable test that depends a little bit on the operator, uh, but the bash operator, whatever is printed on the standard out, is returned in a variable and then you can just uh, uh, check if the result is indeed what you expect it to be. So in this case, I have a bash operator. I say bash command is echo hello and then hello will be returned in this result and we assert if the result is indeed hello. Uh, one thing to note here, execute uh, requires a, uh, an argument named context, but you can leave it empty. Um, but we'll look at this later. So this is a very simplest test you can uh, you can do, or unit test you can do in the, with Airflow. Uh, this doesn't really require a meta storage, so you can just copy paste this script and run it. So a little bit more complex because we're going to add a execution date, which is one of the uh, uh, items in your context uh, task concept, task instance context in the Airflow. Uh, so if you want to do anything with your execution date in, uh, in your task, you can provide one in your test just by hand. So we give it a date time of January 1st. We format it like day, month, year, and we check is the result indeed January 1st, 21st. So this still works. Uh, the point where this sort of basic unit testing fails is when you want to do templating. And the reason for that, let me show you an example first. So let's say you want to test your bash operator again. You say echo hello today, or uh, echo today is uh, uh, the template execution date. We give the execution date here and we expect to see this string, but actually it returns literally the templated string without the templating applied. And the reason this fails is uh, because execute is, uh, yeah, it doesn't do the templating. And uh, when you run a task in Airflow, there's a lot of things happening. Um, 
and execute is basically called at the very end after the templating is already done. So if you just call execute, there will be no templating. So if we like that, like to do uh, to, to test our templates, we need a little bit more code. <clears throat> so we can't call execute anymore. Uh, but in uh, yeah, there's a couple of things happening when you run a task. Uh, like I said, templating is one of them and a couple of levels of abstraction higher in the, the Airflow uh, yeah, API. There's this method called run, um, which includes templating and calling pre-execute, execute, post-execute, post those kind of methods. So we can use that to actually run a task, including the templating. Uh, the thing to note here is um, task of run is actually used to run multiple tasks in Airflow. Um, so yeah, in testing, typically you just want to run one single test or task uh, to validate if that's uh, correct. So that's why I always align the start and the end date in my tests. This this way of testing is a little bit more involved because you need an Airflow Metastore. So to set it up, you could run Airflow DB in it and in your home directory that will create a SQLite database called Airflow DB. Um, so we go to the terminal, run Airflow DB in it. Let me open up. The project view first. So we'll create a SQLite database if you have no uh, specific configurations. And oh, maybe. Oh, yeah, here it is. So that will create an airflow.db file. And this is a SQLite meta store, and you, you can use this in your tests. Uh, by default, this will go to your home directory. So that's probably not so ideal. So generally I set my Airflow home uh, environment variable to my I point that to my project directory. So it ends up in my in my project instead of my own home directory. Uh, but still, this is not really ideal. So if you were to uh, instantiate the Airflow Metastore for every uh, test, that's uh, yeah, a bit impractical. So what I'd like to do uh, with the help of PyTest, I have this magical fixture in a file called conftest.py. And this uh, fixture I can use throughout all my airflow tests uh, because I said this argument auto use is true. And what this will do is it will actually reset the airflow metastore uh, for every Test session. So that means every time I start PyTest, it will reset the Airflow Metastore. And ideally, yeah, you always want your test to be sort of isolated from everything else. Uh, so I, I set a couple of defaults, for example, to not include default connections, not include any example DAGs. So I have an em empty Airflow Metastore and I can uh, safely yeah, query the meta store without uh, any anything being already in there. So this picture you place in a file named conftest.py. And this is a little bit of PyTest magic. Uh, there's this, uh, this convention in PyTest that anything in a conftest.py file is read when you run uh, a PyTest session. And that's automatically, uh, you can use anything in here in your, uh, throughout your tests. So if I have, for example, um, this templating example that I just showed, and I run this, you actually see a lot of output. All these lines. This is actually a result of Airflow resetting the Airflow Metastore. Then it runs a test. And optionally, you can also remove the, the Metastore afterwards. So this PyTest fixture helps you in the 
in the sense that you don't have to manually instantiate an airflow meta store anymore during your test. You can just include this in your project and it will automatically uh, create a meta store for your test wherever your airflow code needs it. Yeah, we'll clean up the files. <clears throat> Uh, so to, in order to use templating, uh, yeah, for templating, Airflow uh, uh, needs a couple of things uh, besides a meta store, and uh, that's all. Uh, one of them is also a DAG. So whenever you test anything with templating, you also need to instantiate a DAG. And here I run DAG clear. Uh, that uh, basically clears any task instances. Um, yeah, basically, if you have a meta store and you run a task. With tests, it will leave some state in there. So that's why I always call that clear in my test. And lastly, um, task.run will not return any output like task.execute. Uh, and the reason for that is task.run actually uh, it can be responsible for running multiple tasks. And as a, result, as a result, it doesn't return any value. So I have to do a little trick here. And that is uh, whatever I'm uh, echoing with my bash command, I write that to a file. And the file is actually a temporary file. So that will, will be automatically cleaned up after my uh, test. Um, so with Python, you get a couple of magic fixtures, one of them being tempoff. So you can use that it's like automatically available in your tests. Uh, so I create a temporary output file and I echo my whatever will be created here into this output file. And then to assert the result, I will read that output file and check if that's indeed what I expect it to be. So that's how you can uh, yeah, write a unit test on an operator uh, with templating. So unit test with mocking gets a bit more complex here, uh, but sometimes you want to mock things and that's typically uh, when you want to talk to any external system in your test. Um, typically you run a test on your laptop and you don't have access to any say production database or production systems. So uh, in order to keep your test, yeah, basically able to run on your laptop, uh, one of the ways to do that is with the help of mocking. And mocking allows you to replace functionality with fake behavior. Uh, yeah, one, like I said, to avoid calling any external systems, but also to, uh, you might want to use it to return a predictable outcome. If you have, for example, an API that you're calling and that always returns some sort of random result, you could use mocking to uh, return one single predictable outcome. So mocking actually works by importing it first from the unit test library. Um, there's also a mocking utility in PyTest, uh, which is kind of like a wrapper around this thing. Uh, but yeah, in order to not make it too complex, I'll just import it from here. And then you call mock.patch. And you need a little bit of knowledge of the internals when, you're, when you start mocking, because you need to know at what point or what method is responsible for making a call to an external system. So if uh, we have, yet again, a batch operator that we would like to test and we would like, like to test it, uh, yeah, a template where it would go in a real Airflow set, setup, it would go to the meta store, check for a variable named employees, uh, which we don't have in our test suite. Uh, so then we need to know where in Airflow this, um, yeah, what method is responsible for making the call to the meta store, and that's this method. So we call mock.patch on it, and that will basically replace its functionality. And we can, in this case, give it a return value of uh, these three employees. So whenever we, we run this test, uh, instead of Airflow going to the meta store and saying, hey, give me a variable named employees, it will actually just return this Python array. And that allows us to run our test on our laptop without 
the need to connect to any production system. Um, there's different ways to specify mocks uh, or to, uh, to patch. Uh, one, like I showed in the example in the previous slide as a context manager. So you say with mock.patch, and then you do something with that mock variable. Um, once you start mocking multiple, multiple things, uh, yeah, it's not ideal because you get multiple levels of uh, context managers and that's uh, uh, your code goes a little bit unreadable. So whenever I have more than, more, more than one mock, I typically prefer to reuse uh, the decorated version. Which can do by uh, setting a, a mock.patch decorator on your your test function, and might not be super intuitive, but uh, the the last yeah decorator is actually the first argument on your on your function, and this avoids having multiple nested levels. So here's another example, basically same, exact same functionality. You have a batch operator where you want to print a variable named employees. And this is another way you can do it with a decorator, you patch the, uh, the environment. And another way to set variables in, uh, in Airflow is by an uh, environment variable called uh, Airflow var and then the name of the variable. And you can give it this thing. And again here, uh, so this will be, will replace the, the airflow functionality where it goes to the meta store and instead give it, um, yeah, this return value. So unit testing with Docker. So once we're done with mocking, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, there are just certain things which don't, which don't allow for mocking. Um, sometimes you need a lot of knowledge of the internals of a certain system, uh, or there's just no nice mocking library available for whatever it is that you're testing with. <clears throat> so one of the options uh, to work around that is uh, with uh, the help of Docker. And Docker allows us to create, uh, basically run a, a real system that we can use in our tests. The code gets a little bit lengthy, but I'll, I'll break it down. Um, so for running Docker in my tests, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a couple of plugins you can use with PyTest. Uh, I tried a few, but uh, PyTest Docker tools stuck with me and I've, I've been using it for a while now. And this is a, it's kind of like a, a PyTest plugin that allows you to uh, run certain Docker statements like create a container, and uh, work with a Docker container in your test. So I'll break down this long piece of code here. I hope this is large enough. Oh. Uh, basically, you start with importing the, the plugin. Fetch allows you to specify an image and then container allows you to specify a container. And this is again, a PyTest fixture. So if you add it as an argument on your test, PyTest will know, hey, there's a container fixture here and it will know to create a container for this test. Then to connect with this Postgres co container, um, Normally you would specify a connection in your Airflow Metastore, um, which again, we have an empty Metastore uh, throughout our test. So we don't really want that. So we would mock out a, uh, the, the calls to the, the Metastore and return a fake or dummy connection, which now points to our container. And this way we have a running Postgres container and we can run the Postgres operator on that. Uh, so the Postgres operator here, we'll run a statement to create a table, insert four rows. And the, op the Postgres operator doesn't allow for returning any 
uh, values. So we have a second operator uh, called the SQL value check operator, which uh, yeah can return one single value. And we use that to check if indeed uh, the count of the number of rows is indeed four. So if I run this in here, I can run the test. I have to be a little bit quick here. You'll see that it creates a Docker container for my test and it's pretty quick because the, yeah, the image is already on my machine. So it creates a container from this image, basically calls the Postgres operator on it and then calls the, uh, the test. The, sorry, the, the SQL value check operator on that to check if there's indeed four rows inserted by the Postgres operator. So that's how you can check against a real uh, database in this case with the help of Docker. So this still goes into individual uh, operators. So sometimes you would like uh, to test, uh, to do some integration testing. Uh, so at some point you're done with testing individual operators and you would like to know if uh, multiple operators together actually uh, do what you expect it to do. So just like task.run, you also have a dag.run method. And this allows you to run a complete dag in a test. So in uh, in my inside my test here, I specified a dag which reflects this thing. And I want to ensure that when it's uh, a weekend, for example, that it actually executes this task. So uh, then I have to make sure that my starting date here, because that's the date for which uh, my DAG will run, is a weekend uh, day. Then I can run the DAG and I can perform all sorts of checks if the state was successful and if the if certain tasks were either skipped or if they were successful. So you need a little bit of in, uh, knowledge of the internals of, uh, of Airflow to, to yeah, understand that there's, for example, a state uh, attribute on your DAG run. But yeah, once you have that, you can check if uh, this DAG runs correctly from within the test. So typically I would, uh, I, I would write a lot of tests for individual operators. And then, uh, yeah, I would write this test after that, uh, just to pull a little bits and pieces of a typically larger DAG to validate if the connectivity between multiple operators works correctly. So at this point, we only, yeah, we wrote a lot of code, uh, but sometimes, yeah, you just want to test against a real system. Uh, ideally, you have more than uh, one system to do that. Uh, so you don't really want to deploy into a production system and uh, trigger the DAG and see if it works. Um, but yeah, if you want a, uh, to have a second, second system or maybe a third or a fourth, um, you would set those up and to, to, to bring your DAG from just a, a branch into production, this is typically what people do. They have mo multiple branches, each reflecting to a specific uh, or corresponding to a specific uh, airflow deployment. Um, and then via pull request, you would merge from one branch to an, into another, uh, all the way into production until you run in your production environment via a series of checks. So, and then, uh, yeah, your development environment or uh, test or accept oh, te test or acceptance environment would typically mimic your production environment, but uh, yeah, the the. The development environment is typically a very small environment, just uh, able to run your tests, whereas the production environment is generally a lot larger to uh, able to, to run your full workflows. But then the Airflow CLI, uh, it can help us in two ways. Uh, there's a command called Airflow tasks test, 
and that will allow you to run a, uh, a single test or single uh, task, sorry, for a given execution date. Um, so in order to run this, uh, let's say you have your DAG, hello world. You can call airflow tasks test, and then your DAG ID and a task you would like to test for a given execution date. And we'll actually perform a, a single run of that, that task. So in this case, it prints world, which is over here. Um, you can use this locally uh, just for quickly running a single task. Uh, I have also used it in production to, uh, to place a breakpoint in my code, but it's kind of bad practice, but it can help you out in, uh, in certain, uh, yeah, certain cases. So this allows you to, uh, yeah, to run a task from the command line instead of the UI. Then besides tasks, you can also run a complete DAG with the command line. And this uh, will use a so-called debug executor, uh, basically to do the same thing. Uh, but after uh, completing a task, it will yeah, go to the next task and run the whole thing from your command line. So it might be helpful for our testing. It brings us to the last topic. CICD, so how do you run tests in your CICD? Uh, generally, I have a couple of things. So first are set, static checks. These are typically uh, yeah, things like flake eight or black or pilot. And these check more like conventions on your code. So if you stick to the, the Python conventions, for example, uh, and these are run first because these are very quick and, uh, and small to run. And then I run my all my tests because are, these are typically a bit uh, bigger to, to, to run and uh, take longer. And once this works successfully, then you would deploy your code. So I have a example here. This is with GitHub Actions. We'll share this uh, code after the, after the session with you so you can uh, copy paste it into your own project if you would like to. So whenever you push code, because there's an on push keyword here, it would perform a couple of checks. Uh, so first static checks, and only once those complete, uh, you, you would run your PyTest suite in here. It will run all your tests. And if anything fills in here throughout your test, then it will fill here. And then if you have a, another step here for doing a deployment, that will, that will be skipped. So that's how you can run your test in a, uh, in a CI CD system. Um, we'll share the slides and uh, everything afterwards. Uh, there's a couple of links that, uh, that I referred to in my, in what I just said in the last half hour. Uh, but generally I suggest to, to read the PyTest documentation. It's uh, pretty well written and uh, very useful for knowing all the ins and outs of PyTest. Um, for running, uh, tests with the help of Docker, there's this plugin, pretty useful. And uh, I always find the Airflow source code always uh, also a good source for inspiration on, on how to write tests. So if, you, uh, if you're a bit stuck on, uh, say, mocking, it could help to, to go to the Airflow source code and uh, get some inspiration there. And that's it. Wow. That was great, Bass. That was very, very deep technical content. There's a lot of questions here. Um, we're going to do our best to get through them, but I don't know if we'll have enough time to get through all of them because we only have okay. about 15 minutes left. Um, so I'll just read them to you and you can uh, you can take your best crack at it. Yep. Um, so one question that a few people have asked um, is when you're doing unit testing in Airflow, should you focus more on unit testing the DADs or unit testing the operators? Like where, where should the emphasis be? Yeah, uh, generally a unit test is uh, testing a, a single piece of logic. So I think it naturally fits in more with testing individual operators. Um, and yeah, testing a complete DAG, I would consider more of an integration test, but uh, regardless, uh, 
uh, the yeah whatever name you give it. I think testing individual operators um, for me personally already gives like a, say a very large uh, confidence that my workflow run correctly uh, and the integration of multiple uh, tests is generally something I do at the end. And yeah. it's typically also what you do a little bit more with a DTAP environment where you check if a complete workflow runs correctly. Yeah. Um, and then a follow-up question to that that uh, some mm -hmm. card have asked is, yep. is it enough to just put your DAGs through CI CD or do you also recommend uh, running them in an actual airflow environment like you have here? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, it depends question or uh, answer, sorry. Um, I think a CI CD is, uh, is, yeah, that's mandatory. I uh, never advise to uh, copy paste your DAGs into uh, environment. Uh, so first, uh, yeah, CICD, and then depending on, yeah, a lot of factors, for example, how big your team is and how many uh, environments they, they, yeah, they have the bandwidth for to, to manage. Um, yeah, some companies or some, some teams decide to just go for two environments, so a development and a production environment. Uh, but generally, yeah, the bigger the team, the more environments you see. Yeah. For sure, that's. I would echo that. You know, I think that yeah. after you get to a certain scale, it makes sense to um, have dedicated infra just for development. But if it's just one or two users, right, that might be overkill. It really depends on uh, you know what you're doing. If you're only writing, if you only have a couple of users, but you're writing very business critical workloads, then it might make sense to uh, invest in a proper test environment. Um, cool. So another question is a little bit about the content itself. Um, yeah. What do you need to run it? Um, I think this will be clear when you send it out, but do you need to have Astronomer running? Do you need to just have a couple of Python things on your local? Like, what do you need to run the content? Yeah. Um, so we'll share this project uh, after the, the session. But basically, it's all vanilla uh, Airflow, what I just showed. You need uh, Apache Airflow installed, obviously, and then you need PyTest. That's the uh, very beginning. And when you, once you go into... Uh, things like Docker, then there's a, yeah, a plugin you need to install, but this can run on any system. Um, there's nothing uh, astronomer specific here. Perfect. Awesome. Except for this uh, screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so Joe Math is asking, uh, first off, he says, great presentation. He thanks you, but he's asking, um, would it be possible to run DAG tests and validate the next few expected uh, execution and run dates? For example, if we have a daily DAG, can we set up tasks that asserts, let's say the next three execution and run rates? Um, this would make it easier for devs that are having a tough time making sure Airflow runs at the date it's supposed to. Right. Uh, so, so if I, if I, uh... If I get it correctly, uh, you want to run a DAG for three specific dates to validate if that works correctly. Yeah, I mean, to make sure the next couple of expected dates are templated incorrectly. Okay. Um, yeah, there is. Uh, go back a little bit. Yeah, Joe. One thing I'll say while Bass pulls that up is with Airflow two two, which is due out, uh, I believe, next week or the week after, so relatively soon. Um, there's going to be some more um, ways to schedule their DAG that'll make it so that the it'll be more clear that when a DAG is going to run on its expected date. So uh, that is going to be made easier for all users in the very near future. Um, back to you, Bass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, both the task build run that I showed here and a little bit down in this part, DAG dot run, they both take a uh, uh, yeah, are responsible for running a range of either tasks or DAGs for a range of dates. So in my test, I, I generally fix these to the same date so that I run only one single instance. Uh, but if you give the end date, uh, set the end date to you know, sometime later than the, the starting date, um, yeah, Airflow actually figures out with the schedule how many 
uh, runs to to execute, and uh, that should uh, yeah help your use case. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna keep feeding this to you, Bass. <laughs> sure. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, Eric is asking um, for the code samples that you showed. You showed them yep. using the Python operator. Um, yep. Can you do similar tests using the Taskful API and the new decorators as you've shown here? Uh, in the end, it's all Python code. So uh, simple answer is yes. I don't have a uh, an example lying around, unfortunately. So uh, I can uh, maybe add one to the repository afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that, that, yeah, just like uh, uh, yeah, your normal Python operator. Um, I think if you need a test immediately, uh, like I said, you go to the Airflow source code. It's always a, a good source of inspiration for me for uh, seeing how yeah the core developers uh, test mm -hmm. um, yeah stuff in Airflow. Um, this is a general question from a few people that I've asked, but yes. when you're testing something that's you know interacting with data, you know, so with something like BigQuery, Redshift, etc., mm -hmm. um, are there any best practices for how you should incorporate some sort of uh, data aware tests inside of your Airflow tests? Yeah, um, it's a bit. Uh, there's not really one straight answer. <laughs> uh, it gets uh, yeah, it's a bit tricky, but. Generally, um, I would try to get a little sample data set if it's not uh, PI data, of course. So if there's no privacy uh, uh, sensitive data, uh, that's okay to, to stick into your project. You could use that to uh, um, say you have a little data set of uh, 10 or 100 rows, that's not very big. You could stick that into your project and incorporate that in your tests. Um, if not, then uh, yeah, you're probably gonna have to look at DTAP environments where you keep data outside your Airflow uh, project and uh, run in a yeah, live Airflow scenario, but maybe uh, in, a, in a bit smaller setting than in your production environment. Makes total sense. And uh, yeah, there's also uh, other tools for doing data testing or data quality testing, like uh, grid expectations. I think the Airflow guides have a, have a uh, the astronomer website have, has an airflow guide there. Yep, yeah. And those SQL check operators you showed are actually really helpful as well, you know, especially for that baseline stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we have a couple of guides on using those as well. Um, cool. So we have another question here. I give me one second. Are there any recommendations for when you're trying to run these sorts of tests, but you're generating your DAGs dynamically? So if you're doing something like a DAG factory or a task generator, right? Maybe reading off a list or something, um, how would you handle testing in those sorts of scenarios? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I would probably try to resemble your production setting as closely as possible. Um, I don't know, yeah, what your, um, yeah, what 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 is the result of your dynamic uh, deck? So if it's a list or a query somewhere, uh, but I would, yeah, try to mimic your real scenario as much as possible. If that's a good answer. I hope that answers. No, I think so. I think so. I think that did answer it. That's a really hard one, right? Because it's also tough to know what your dad's going to look like every day. <laughs> oh. um, cool. So let's see here. Uh, what's another question folks have? Do you... Do you have any thoughts on how you'd want to test the structure of a DAG as part of your CI system? So you want to make sure that a user doesn't fundamentally change the structure of a DAG too much. How would you go about testing something like that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds more like a, a like a sort of like a, almost like an admin uh, convention, like a convention that an administrator would make that your DAGs are not uh, allowed to to change too much. Yeah. Um, Uh, 
that's uh yeah the only thing i can say about testing the structure of a dag is in the beginning of my uh the presentation you have this dag bag that allows you to pull out all the dag objects from your from your uh, your code and you can apply certain conventions here so say you can test if there are any tags in this example mm -hmm. uh, but this is where you can also uh, check on certain yeah structural things maybe mm -hmm. um, if you prefer that cool um, and then another question that I think I've had this one this one before um, yep. which maybe publish one of these but when you're talking about the internals of airflow um, do you have a cheat sheet of the most kind of uh, important functions to think about when you're thinking about testing um, I feel like that's a very common ask. Maybe we should publish one of those. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't have a cheat sheet. That's a, the short answer. Um, but typically execute. That's the, the method uh, that, that every operator implements. So generally calling this thing is uh, step number one. But yeah, in some scenarios, like I showed uh, with uh, templating, that doesn't work. So that's where you have to resort to pulling, not execute, but run. Um, but I don't really have a, like a clear, nice overview of which uh, classes and which methods to call. Uh, I hope this presentation gives you some, some guidance there. Yeah, well, that should be a, it'd be a good follow on blog post, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 true. Yeah. And maybe, maybe we can get one of those scheduled to the backlog as well. <laughs> um, awesome. I think we have time for one more question. Um, sure. And then um, we can kind of handle the rest of them asynchronously. Um, so I guess, so Ricardo's asking, um, is there a way to mock S3 to test the DAG that uses S3 operators or hooks? Um, how would you recommend doing that? Yeah, there's... Uh... I can't remember if I've ever mocked S3 myself, but I've worked with Moto. Uh, yes, Moto library. Mm. And in my experience, it's pretty decent in mocking a lot of AWS services. And I think they had, oh yeah. So this is a pretty decent library in, uh, and can mock all sorts of AWS services. They don't support it 100%. But in my experience, it works pretty decent. So there's a mock S3 decorator. Hopefully, oh, I actually have an example here uh, where you can mock any calls to S3. So I strongly suggest you check out the Moto library. And um, yeah, this way you don't need to connect to any live Amazon account. Awesome. All righty. Um, I know there's still a lot of questions that we haven't got to yet. Um, I wish we had more time, but with five minutes left, I think we'll have to, we'll have to bounce. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, all the content will be distributed to you all afterwards. Um, Bass, thank you so much for going through this. This was awesome. Um, I've never known, I've never learned so much about airflow testing in so, such little time. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to get a lot of, lot of requests after this. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.